If you're someone who has heard the phrase, you're too sensitive, or someone who considers themselves an empath, or is easily affected by other people's moods, or you're someone who is easily stimulated by light, color, texture, sound, etc., or processes emotions and thoughts in a way that feels deeper, finds themselves analyzing all the time, and seems to feel things that other people don't, then hi, you might just be a highly sensitive person. Being a highly sensitive person is not a medical diagnosis or a medical condition and does not require treatment. So as someone who understands themselves to have been a highly sensitive person her entire life, I feel 100% empowered and entitled to share this video. In this video, I am going to be breaking down high sensitivity, what it is, the good, the bad, the ugly, and what I personally do so that things don't end up getting ugly for me, so that I can enjoy my life with the perspective that high sensitivity is actually a gift. Now, whether you've been here before or you're new to me, welcome to my corner of the internet. My name is Melanie Santos. I'm a mind, body, spirit, wellness educator and creator, energy practitioner, spiritual medium and guide, and Kundalini yoga priestess. I am super passionate about creating space for discovery, healing, learning how to live intentionally, embracing our nuances as energy beings and human bodies, and talking about all the things that we can do to align with our divine truth and our absolute best experience in this life. In my community, we are all about real, practical, holistic self-care for collective liberation. Now, what does it mean to be a highly sensitive person? Again, high sensitivity isn't a disorder or a condition. It's actually a personality trait known as sensory processing sensitivity, or SPS, not to be confused with sensory processing disorder. As I go into the topic, I'm going to be quoting from medical journals and research, most of which originated with Dr. Elaine Aaron, a clinical research psychologist and the author of The Highly Sensitive Person. I talked about this in my most recent mental health update video, but learning that I was a highly sensitive person and reading that book quite literally changed my life. After suffering with feeling grossly misunderstood my whole life, feeling like I was super high or super low all of the time and never in balance, like I couldn't live a normal life because I felt everything around me at all times and it was very overwhelming, reading Dr. Aaron's book opened me up to the world of high sensitivity. It made me feel like, wow, I feel seen, like I'm not odd. Actually, according to Dr. Aaron, who developed the concept of highly sensitive persons in the 90s, 15 to 20% of people are highly sensitive people or HSPs. Now let's get into the science. Do not skip this part. This is very important. Here's what you need to know. A highly sensitive person is a neurodivergent individual whose brain is wired differently and because of it has an increased or deeper central nervous system sensitivity to physical, emotional, or social stimuli. Being a highly sensitive person depends on various factors like evolution, environment, genetics, and early childhood experiences. And research says that the trait exists in at least a hundred other species aside from humans. Now, Dr. Elaine Aaron broke up high sensitivity into four main pillars, and does, D-O-E-S, is a helpful way to remember them. D, depth of processing, O, over arousal, E, empathy, and S, sensory specific sensitivity. And all of this is due to the biological differences in the highly sensitive brain. You ready? HSPs are uniquely wired to process everything more deeply. That's because the parts of the brain responsible for visual and attention processing, specifically the cingulate or premotor area, are stronger and more active than in a neurotypical brain. The highly sensitive brain never really shuts off. It's quite literally always going and processing much more than the average person's. Now, the genes responsible for serotonin, dopamine, and neuropinephrine are vastly different in the highly sensitive brain too. You might know serotonin as a chemical that carries messages between nerve cells in the brain throughout the body. It plays a key role in functions like mood, sleep, digestion, etc. The serotonin transporter is a chemical that transports serotonin out of the brain. Now, highly sensitive people have a variant of the serotonin transporter gene that decreases serotonin in the brain and increases sensitivity to our surroundings. You might know dopamine as a feel-good chemical. We all need the right amount of dopamine for our brain and body to function. Due to the highly sensitive brain's unique response to stimuli, the way in which the highly sensitive person responds to dopamine is different. 
our reward and pleasure center isn't phased like a neurotypical person's because a highly sensitive person is less driven by external reward as a form of validation. Neuropronephrine is also known as noradrenaline and is both a neurotransmitter and a hormone. It plays a really important role in our body's fight or flight response, helping the body process stress. In the highly sensitive person, there's a variant of that neuropronephrine gene that is common, making processing emotions internally and externally extra intense. A highly sensitive person may also notice emotional nuances that others don't pick up on at all, hence having a super increased capacity for empathy. Also giving us an increased capacity for empathy, the highly sensitive brain has more active mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are a type of brain cell that respond equally when we perform an action and when we witness someone else perform that same action, like when we yawn when someone else yawns. Having more active mirror neurons makes HSPs capable of understanding people's emotions on a much deeper level. It quite literally makes us susceptible to taking on or mirroring the feelings of others. Also super active in the highly sensitive brain, the insular cortex, the part of the brain that attunes us to what's happening within the body from needing to use the bathroom to wanting to cry. This amplifies the processing of bodily sensations, even imbuing them with emotional qualities. Is your mind not completely blown? There is so much more that I could go into scientific detail about here, but these are the main biological differences in the highly sensitive brain and the ones that blew my mind to learn when I was starting to do my own research and committing to reformatting the ways that I live and care for myself so that I could have a more well-rounded human experience. Now let's talk about that. Let's talk about what this all means in the real world. Let's get into the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now I'm going to refer to DOES, D-O-E-S, the four pillars, as we break down the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm also going to share specific self-care recommendations that I've adopted in my life as a highly sensitive being that keep me thriving mentally, physically, spiritually, and energetically. Let's start with depth of processing. People immediately associate processing with this lengthy operation of breaking things down to understand something on a deeper level. But as highly sensitive people, we just do. Like our brains are always firing away, perceiving, breaking things down, making connections, and mentally digesting things from all angles. How fire is that? When it comes to processing emotions, people, and relationships, depth of processing gives us the opportunity to be deeply intentional, to listen more closely, to pay attention to details, and catch nuances that others won't. Depth of processing makes you keenly aware of everything. And if you're grounded spiritually, exist in an energy of love, worthiness, and authenticity, it's truly a recipe for a gorgeous sense of self-awareness, really deep, nourishing conversations, magical relationships, and connections in which you can feel the alignments happening or misalignment, which is also loud, clear, and necessary too. But what happens on the other side? when depth of processing can get or feel bad. Well, just like a computer heats up when it's been on and processing too long, our brains and bodies can become overstimulated if we don't make a conscious effort to power down. This is especially the case if our depth of processing is mixed in with unprocessed and complex trauma, a constant feeling of lack of safety due to being rooted in survival, self-loathing, lack of worthiness, anxious attachment styles, etc. Then awareness becomes hypervigilance. Deep conversations are the stuff of nightmares. Engaging with others authentically in relationships can be really, really challenging. And our mind can feel like it's going on an incessant loop. This isn't only draining on the mind, but on the body and the spirit too. At its ugliest, depth of processing can result in really poor mental health. The inability to move forward, make decisions, be rooted in what's actually your truth and not what your brain has perceived and is telling you stories about, it can be detrimental. I am definitely speaking from experience here. When I'm great, I'm the most conscious, most intentional listener and communicator, a true artist in the way that I can digest and understand things and spit them back out. But when it's gotten ugly for me, I've become completely paralyzed, drowning in severe depression and anxiety not able to stand in my truth because of the stories that I've told myself. I lost a lot because of this, but mostly I've lost respect, time, 
and relationships over my lifetime. Since then, I've learned to give myself pause, to prioritize stillness so that my mind, body, and spirit won't have a chance to get tangled in the web of my depth of processing. If you resonate with being a highly sensitive person, I have two words for you, meditation and breath work. I know, I know, but I bet you've never thought about this, but the only thing that your mind and body will obey is your breath. When you're not breathing, you're nothing. When you combine conscious breathing with stillness and silence, you give yourself active pause. It's not that you'll stop processing because now you know that's literally impossible, but you give yourself fences to stay within. You can still see through the fences, but your breathing can keep you in check. You have nothing to lose by trying it. Start with guided breath work and meditation. I have meditations on this channel and on my Instagram page, and I have an in-depth recorded class on my website where I break down 10 plus discreet but essential breathwork techniques to regulate your nervous system. You can visit melaniesantos.co slash classes or click the link in the description box. And because you're watching this right now and you just liked this video, right? You can use the code YouTube to take 20% off your purchase. Now let's get into over arousal and sensory sensitivity. Get your mind out of the gutter if you only associate arousal sexually. To become aroused just means to awaken a feeling, emotion, or response. And because of the highly sensitive brain's ability to process everything much deeper than the neurotypical brain, arousal is an all the time thing. Yes, literally, brain orgasms. If you know, you know. When it's good, it's amazing. As an artsy fartsy music obsessed creative being myself, I love deeply engaging with stimuli and flowing with my arousal. It allows me to get pleasurably lost in things, to experience the magic in art, music, and movement. I am always that girl crying at the museum because a painting or sculpture moved me or closing my eyes at a concert to feel the music raise the little hairs all over my body. And I cannot explain the process of creating something myself. It is otherworldly. Arousal to me, it feels like it makes my aura expand. But what happens on the other side when arousal becomes over arousal? Over arousal can be characterized by the mind and body taking in too much. When there is too much visual, auditory, and energetic stimuli. Lights, color, sound, people, texture. It can overwhelm our extra sensitive nervous systems, activate our fight or flight response, and raise our cortisol levels, our stress hormone, because our body can perceive too much stimuli as a threat. Of course, this isn't the case, but to the highly sensitive brain, it's all the same. This one is really hard for me personally, and I think it can be for most people, especially if they are highly sensitive extroverts, which make up 30% of the highly sensitive population. Think about it. You're out, you're aroused by all the amazing sights and sounds, colors, tastes, textures, and you don't know how to stop. You don't want to stop because it feels so good. So you keep going and going and going until you crash. For me, that overstimulated crash, again, looks like going from a manic state, going from really, 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 really high to really low, to a deep depression, unable to engage with anything or anyone at all. I go from extrovert to introvert really quickly. Why? Well, because maybe I wasn't giving myself pause and prioritizing the routines and structures that keep me and my nervous system in harmony with myself and with my surroundings. I'm gonna add this. Living in a city, you won't need to be out enjoying yourself to become over aroused. You could be doing monotonous things day to day and still become overstimulated by your environments and the actions that you're performing. I am a New York City native who has experienced mental health issues her whole life. I would know. So what I do besides prioritize stillness and conscious breathing is make sure that my home is optimized for my sensitive nervous system. When the outside is noisy and cluttered and dirty, I can count on my sacred space being just that. We keep Casa de Mui, anywhere we live, that's our home's name, very clean, uncluttered, still aesthetically pleasing to our style, but beautiful and calming to the spirit and overall extremely cozy and accessible. It's why my husband and I have taken so long to finish furnishing our space. We've been here for almost two years. We're very intentional about the things that we bring into our home. Next, I make sure that I energetically cleanse myself every day, and especially after being around other spaces and people. 
This is so incredibly important. We all have an electromagnetic field that extends beyond our physical body. That field is our aura, and it serves a few very important functions for us. It acts as an energetic boundary. It is the magnetic field through which we project our energy and our intentions, as well as where we receive energy. If we are not consistent with our energetic hygiene, we are quite literally going to bed with and living with the energy of other people, places, and things in our personal space. Overstimulation can happen as a result of having too much in and around your aura too. So remember this because this is the way that I teach this to my community. Energy is like bacteria. Some of it is good, some of it is bad, but all of it will stick to you. You can do anything you want to cleanse your energy field, but if you have no idea where to start, I also have a comprehensive recorded class all about this. It's super affordable and it's really detailed, breaking down what it means to be an energy being in a human body, why that matters, and most importantly, giving you various options for cleansing and protecting your energy from free 99 to all types of budgets. To get access to that class, visit melaniesantos.co slash classes. And remember, you can use the code YouTube to take 20% off your purchase. Lastly, let's get into empathy. I'm talking to you, empaths. I know. I was one of you too. So you're not an empath anymore? <laughs> empathy is the capacity to understand or feel what another person is experiencing from within their frame of reference basically to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. But an empath's ability to feel for someone goes beyond empathy. An empath literally feels what others feel at their own emotional level, becoming unable to discern what's their feelings from what's someone else's. If you know, you know. It feels like everybody wants to call themselves an empath, and I don't know why, because being an empath is extremely draining. It's like having a conversation, walking down the street, or even watching something on TV and becoming enmeshed with the other person and their emotions, even though you don't have first person experience with whatever they're going through or they're talking about. As highly sensitive people, we don't have the option to turn it off because again, of the way our mirror neurons are set up. But because I have become so intentional about my energetic hygiene and my personal boundaries, I no longer subscribe to being an empath because I don't want to. There was a time in my life where I felt like I had to succumb to being an empath, to constantly giving up my energy to others. I know better now. Besides having the self-awareness to step away as needed, all of the routines and self-care choices that I've mentioned in this video have helped me so much. But most recently, learning the intricacies of Kundalini Yoga and integrating its technology into my daily life has been incredibly healing for my mind, body, and spirit as an ex-empath. I have a playlist of videos on Kundalini Yoga that you can check out, but basically, Kundalini Yoga is the fastest way to create transformation and align your mind, body, and spirit. It weaves together pranayama, breath work, kriyas and asanas, strategic postures, meditation, and mantra to shift your glandular, electromagnetic, circulatory, and nervous system and raise your kundalini energy, the energy of atomic creativity, and unlock the God and the universe within and beyond ourselves. For me, kundalini yoga is a way to prioritize stillness and conscious breathing for my depth of processing and arousal, strengthen my aura so that I am both protected from too much stimuli, and so that I'm projecting centered thoughts and energy into the universe, and it roots me in satnam, that truth is my identity and truth is my name. That I don't have to take on the energy of anything or anyone that isn't my truth. It's been a literal godsend, which is why I'm teaching it from my perspective now. I recommend you check out my budding kundalini yoga playlist of videos and taking a class or joining me for a new moon kundalini portal if you're interested. You can visit melaniesantos.co slash kundalini yoga. I truly hope that this video has given you a well-rounded understanding of what it is to be a highly sensitive person, how to navigate and care for yourself, because it isn't a curse. It's truly such a gift to be able to see, feel, and experience the world in this way. To be neurodivergent, or how I say it, neurosparkly, can be challenging in a world built for neurotypical people. 
but taking the time to invest in your knowledge of you, taking steps and changing your foundation so that you can thrive is one of the best forms of self-love. So shout out to you. If you learned something and you appreciated this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel for more mind, body, spirit, wellness, healing, alignment, and identity content. And please share the love. Send this to someone who you think can benefit from it. Stay safe. Stay intentional. Sending you mad love. Peace.